Let's get to it. Ian Castleberry playing with us. Lots of Major League Baseball headlines to get to with Ian today, presented by Blue Mountain Pizza, Main Street in Weaverville. All right, Ian, so good to have you in, my friend. Oh, great to be here. How are you? Hey, man, I'm, I'm hanging in there, and we've got some goodies, certainly, to get to today. And if there's time left, maybe your comment on a big Lions win just yesterday. But first things first, buddy, the Astros win the World Series. Gusty gets his first World Series title as a manager. Uh, we'll do more on that in a moment. And, Ian, uh, the Phillies look like their Cinderella run would continue after that Game 1 win in Houston. But how was Houston able to not only recover to win the next four out of five games? Yeah, after playing home run derby game three, you know, it, it, it looked like the Phillies might be in control of this thing, but that was really the last time their bats showed any life. And uh, going into the World Series, the, the Astros had the better pitching, and it, that finally asserted itself from game four on. You know, there, there was the game four no hitter, Christian Javier, six innings, no hits, and then followed by three relievers. So that was, you know, shutting down the, the, the Phillies lineup. But then Tramber Valdez, he had two starts in the World Series, only allowed two runs. Justin Verlander, maybe not vintage Justin Verlander, but still pitched well enough to get his first World Series win. Two starts, he allowed six runs and ten hits. And you just you look at for games four, five, and six, the Phillies combined to get nine hits and three runs in three games. Mm. So they were just completely shut down. Houston had a 2.83 ERA. Their bullpen was outstanding, a 0.84 ERA uh, over those six games. And then consequently, because the Astros were pitching so well, the batters that were putting up superstar performances to get the Phillies to the World Series, notably Bryce Harper, Bryce Harper hit 200 in the World Series. He did hit one home run. Kyle Schwarber hit three home runs but overall batted 250. Reese Hoskins disappeared, batting 120. Nick Castellanos, 125. JT Real Muto, 167. So um, not only the star players, but the the role players or or the mid-range guys who were coming up big throughout the postseason for the Phillies just disappeared in the World Series, thanks in large part to the Astros pitching. Wow. Yeah, you laid that out really well. And you, you died. You, I almost forgot about the combined no hitter in this series as well. Good Lord. Now, it's funny because, you know, can you name every position player on Houston? You probably could, Ian. I, I would, ha- I'd struggle to get maybe half. Even the guys on the Dan Patrick show today, uh, were, were joking about that. Like they couldn't figure out who was the catcher for Houston. I believe it's Maldonado. But nonetheless, you know, it seems like Houston here, they win the World Series. No respect right away, Vegas has another team who says it has better odds to win the World Series in 2023 in the Dodgers. Here we go again. Yeah, um, I understand You know, the Dodgers are annually the best team in baseball. They have uh, the best lineup, the best starting rotation. I don't know if I would make them the odds-on favorite this coming season. Uh, you know, Walker Buehler, I think, is still going to be out after Tommy John's surgery. Uh, they're going to lose some other pitchers. Some guys are retiring. Cody Bellinger, that's going to be a big decision for the Dodgers. Are they going to keep him? And you would think it would be just uh, unfathomable that they would let him go, but he has not been good the past two, three seasons. And rather than give him a raise, they may let Cody Bellinger go or at least not tender him a contract and try to bring him back at a lower price. But you still have a lineup with two MVPs and Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts. Will they keep Trey Turner? That would be a huge loss for them. So I think there are some question marks for the Dodgers. Yet you look at the rest of the National League, is anybody else better, at least during the regular season? So I guess I understand why the Dodgers are the odds-on favorites, but I I don't think that they are as far ahead as the Vegas odds might have them in the National League. And as you pointed out, the Astros right behind them uh, as a favorite. Uh, We're joined by Ian Castleberry with Barrett Sports Media on the D.C. Creaseman Jewelers Wise Lines. And uh, Ian's appearance today presented Talking Baseball uh, by Blue Mountain Pizza Main Street in Weaverville. Ian, how are the Phillies shaping up for 2023? First of all, uh, let's put this Phillies run in perspective. Last year... This Phillies team would not have been in this position. They wouldn't have made the playoffs. They made the playoffs as the last wild card, the extra wild card that was added this season. Bryce Harper had an outstanding season, but he mostly played at designated hitter because he had an elbow injury that prevented him from playing the outfield. Well, they couldn't have done that last year. There was no universal DH. 
So, yeah. uh, you know, a lot of factors came together for the Phillies to make this uh, improbable postseason run. But they are bringing back most of their team. They're still going to have a very powerful lineup. They're going to their their rotation with Aaron Nola, Zach Wheeler, Ranger Suarez, Jose Alvarado in the bullpen. Those guys didn't pitch well in the World Series, but you know the Phillies wouldn't be there without them. Uh, can they upgrade? You know, the biggest problem with the Phillies, obviously, it didn't matter in the postseason, but their defense really isn't that good over uh, uh, the course of the regular season. Uh, maybe they'll try to make some improvements there. They could upgrade at shortstop. You know, there's some big names on the free agent market. Carlos Correa is back on the free agent market. Trey Turner, Xander Bogart. You know, will, will uh, the Phillies go uh, a- after a player like that? I still think, you know, the Mets and the Braves are going to be ahead of the Phillies in the National League East, but the Phillies made it as a wild card. They finished one game ahead of the Brewers. Going into it right now, I would say the Phillies are better than the Brewers. The Phillies could still make it as a wild card next season. But, again, it was just such a, an improbable run by these Phillies. Can they repeat that magic? Understood on that. As Ian Castleberry plays with the wise guys talking Major League Baseball. And, and Ian, tell us about this record-breaking deal between the Mets and their star closer, Edwin Diaz. Yeah, Edwin Diaz, he had an outstanding season, uh, 32 saves. 1-3-1 ERA, uh, he struck out 118 batters in just 62 innings. And for people who were following, you know, I'm sure Braves fans were rolling their eyes, hating the Mets. But, I mean, Edwin Diaz's entrance into the game to, to get the save or, or to close out a game, coming in from the bullpen with uh, that song Narco by Timmy Trumpet yeah. playing over the loudspeakers, I mean, that just became like a signature moment. In baseball, uh, SNY, the, the, the Mets network did a great job of, you know, not going to a commercial break. You know, they'd stay with Diaz. That he came into the game, it just became this great moment that you, you don't really have in any other sport uh, other than baseball. So Diaz, given a five-year contract or a closer, seems like really a bad idea to me because it, it can disappear. So right, fast, oh. closer. And look at Craig Kimbrell, Eric Gagne. Um, Eric Gagne, but uh, Diaz, uh, with the exception of his first year in New York where he, he was terrible, the past three seasons, uh, including the 2020 season, he's been very, very good to great as a closer. Um, and he did have a – he had 57 saves in 2018 with the Mariners. Uh, he, he didn't begin his career with the Mets. Uh, some listeners might remember. He was part of that Robinson Cano deal uh, that he coming over uh, from Seattle to the Mets. But he's only 28 years old. Um, he's coming off arguably the best season, well, certainly the best season of his career, maybe one of the best seasons a closer has ever had. But, yeah, I would raise my eyebrows a little bit at giving a five-year deal to a closer. It, he's the first closer to sign a $100 million contract, and he's also the first closer to get a $20 million average annual salary. Now, if any closer is worth it, it probably is Edwin Diaz. And the Mets, you know, Steve Cohen, their new owner, uh, certainly has had no problem spending money. Uh, they, they take care of Diaz before he becomes a free agent. Mets fans surely expecting more big moves uh, from the Mets after uh, they fell short uh, against the Braves uh, in the NL East. But, uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd say a five-year deal, that is definitely a risk uh, for yeah. Edwin Diaz. Yeah, agreed for sure. Thanks for your input on that. Is Ian, before uh, we let you go, a couple more items still to go to, get to, rather. All right, so Dusty wins his first World Series as a manager. It couldn't happen to a better guy. I, I met him when I was just a child. I think he might have been the very first professional athlete that I ever met. He was having a clinic at UC Santa Barbara, and my dad brought me out there. And I was he was so nice to everyone. And God, he was so young now that I think about it. But, man, everyone's just loving this guy. Dusty finally gets it, and um, he, he can now – does this push – was he already in the Hall of Fame, or does this help push him into it, Ian? I think he probably was, but yeah, this certainly pushes him into it. I mean, he's won, he's managed five teams in his major league career. He took uh, each one of them to at least one division title. Um, he's a very good uh, player as well. But now the third black manager in major league history to win a World Series. This is a trivia question you can throw out at a party if you want. Cito Gaston, and Dave Roberts, the other two. Uh, 73 years old, the oldest manager to win a World Series. And for all the people who hate the Astros, think they're, you know, the, the biggest villains in, in the major league, I don't think there's anybody who wasn't happy for Dusty Baker. It was such an unusual choice to name him as a manager, right? The, the, the 
the Astros are, are maybe the team when it comes to analytics and putting guys like A.J. Hinch in the dugout, guys who are like extensions of the front office. So after that sign-stealing scandal, you know, they needed goodwill, so they hired Dusty Baker. Uh, it looked like maybe it was sort of a hire. They say, okay, everybody back off. See, we got Dusty Baker. Everybody likes him. But uh, an old-school manager uh, managing a team with a very, very new-school front office, just a, just an outstanding mix. And just, this is just a cap on a great career as a player and a manager for Dusty Baker, uh, as you pointed out. I mean, here's another thing. Maybe you probably knew this, Pat. Listeners probably know this. Dusty Baker was in the on-deck circle when Hank Aaron mm-hmm. hit uh, his 715th home run. So he has been a part of baseball history uh, for, for a long time, uh, and you know, again, to, you know, he he's had some terrible losses. You know, he lost uh, in the World Series where he managed the Giants. He managed the Cubs during the infamous Steve Bartman game. So for him to finally uh, finish this off, and he says, you know, maybe he was just caught up in the euphoria of it all, but he says he wants to come back and try to win another one. Who's to say he can't? But as we just talked about, the Astros are uh, on favorite to to win the 2023 World Series. So why not? Why not another one for Dusty? Hey, I agree. Lovable guy and uh, does know his baseball for sure. Hey, uh, Ian, before we let you go, congrats to your Lions getting yeah. the, the win over the Packers. It, it took a career worst, near near career worst performance by Aaron Rodgers to to make it happen. But Dan Campbell's job may be safe for a couple of weeks. I think so. I mean, they had a rough week. They fired uh, their defensive backs coach, Aubrey Pleasant, who is uh, viewed as an up-and-comer, a possible future defensive coordinator. But apparently that worked because they played great against Aaron Rodgers, Kirby Joseph uh, getting two interceptions. Aaron Rodgers, the Packers, they need receiving help. They didn't run the ball. That was the best defense, best defensive performance the Lions had. I, I certainly wouldn't uh, have expected that. They were... The Packers were driving at the end, and it looked like the Lions were going to blow another one. But uh, usually, you know, throughout a season, you could say, well, the Lions, they'll beat the Packers in Detroit, but they'll get destroyed at Lambeau Field. So we'll see if that happens. But, uh, yeah, a a good win for the Lions, Uh, (laughs) one of very few this season. Well, let me ask you this, and and I want to get your thoughts on my frustration with the Packers and, and how they're kind of dealing with Aaron Rodgers, is that, you know, back in the day in his prime, you know, Aaron Rodgers was able to develop these wide receivers. And you get these guys like, who are these guys? And then two years later, wow, these guys are really good. He he can't do that anymore. I feel like he needs help from the organization, and the organization's not giving it to him. Yeah, maybe the the, the Packers were, were banking on that a little bit too much uh, to uh, to develop guys like Romeo Dobbs and so forth. I mean, you can only go to that. Well, so often right. I mean, to lose. Not, they didn't just lose Devontae the Adams. They lost Marquez, uh, Marquez Valdez, Scantling. They, they they just year after year in the draft we say, why don't they get Aaron Rodgers any help? They don't get him wide receiver. They don't get him a running back. And maybe it, it appears certainly that it, that it's finally caught up with the Packers. Yeah, man. It's. I mean, look at Scantling going to the Chiefs. They'll do anything they can to help Patrick Mahomes. You know, the Bears go out and get. Um, Chase Claypool from Chase Pittsburgh. Chase Claypool, yeah. They'll go out and do whatever they can to help their quarterback. I mean, this is this is shameful. I think what what, what Green Bay is doing to Rodgers, and I'm kind of coming back. I'm coming around to knowing where Aaron's coming from on this, and I can get his frustration for sure. So, you know, we'll we'll see how that plays out. And son of a gun, man, I would, I just wanted to bring that up, kind of get your thoughts on that. And you know, it looks like Minnesota's running away with this division, and the Packers may finish third in this division when it's all said and done. It's like, wow, man, who would have thought of that? Yeah, it'll be interesting on Sunday because the Bears do look like they're the second-best team in the division. They play the Lions this coming Sunday. Uh, it looks like it's coming together for the Bears, but then they trade Roquan, Roquan Smith and Robert Quinn. You think maybe they're rebuilding. Uh, we'll, we'll see what the Bears, you know, can. they should beat the Lions on Sunday. Yeah, man. Um, but, yeah. You know, and uh, Justin Fields, you know, they need, to, uh, they need to start using him more as, like Cam was used by the Panthers in his first few years. Boy, that guy, he is a gazelle. I mean, when he gets out in the open field, he is big. He's got long legs. He's strong. I was impressed. I know they got to get some of the throwing stuff figured out, but man, oh, man, if they could draw up some plays just specific for him, uh, he can be really dynamic there for sure. All right, buddy. That was a spectacular touchdown run. Yeah, yeah wasn't that what, 65 yards? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, buddy, we appreciate you as always. Enjoy the rest of the day, and we'll catch up. Okay, thanks, Pat. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate you. There's Ian Castleberry with the Wise Guys.